we spoke about the secret to mastering pranayam and the secret is extremely simple it is the power of attention it's learning to shift the flow of breath from right nostril to left nostril that may not sound like much of a secret it's very simple it sounds simple but it is not in fact simple it requires a tremendous amount of willpower attention you know uh, awareness as um, well as stamina to keep doing it a lot of people uh, have tried it and we say that it takes about three to four months to be able to do that. That is to do Nadi Shodnam without Vishnu Mitra, without using your fingers and shifting the breath from one nostril to the other. But I also know someone who has done that in 10 days. And so it really depends on individuals those who are better prepared, those who are have a strong power of attention, concentration, those who are very determined, they can do it in a shorter time. Do not underestimate this. It is a very, very powerful practice and really Without mastering that, you will not be able to do any advanced pranayama. So the next thing after that is Sushumna Kriya and so that's what we are going to do today. For that I will use um, the page on Sushumna Kriya, which is on the Tatra's website. It's called Sushumna Kriya Pranayama. And the reason for that I have done this is purely because it is also a Kriya. Some people call it simply Kriya, some call it Pranayama. We are coming to a part which is getting more and more mysterious and difficult to describe. What is clear, however, is that before you start to do this practice, you need to have already established natural effortless diaphragmatic breathing. And you should have even or na equal breath when you breathe naturally, right now, as you're breathing. Your breath should be diaphragmatic, absolutely natural and effortless diaphragmatic breathing, and it should be more or less equal or even. And the reason is that anything else shows that your breathing is still not normalized due to sedentary lifestyle extreme stressful lifestyle our breathing system the entire respiratory system is under extreme stress chronic stress very often and therefore it is no longer natural so we need to first get back to that natural healthy state and once that has been re-established, we can work on the subtler aspects of the breath. The subtler aspects are during pranayam, having a silent breath, no loud breathing, no jerky breathing, a very smooth breath, then eliminating extended pauses. You may have seen people who talk very fast because they're extremely stressed. They speak very fast, rapidly, long sentences without a break, and they actually gasp for breath between a sentence. This extreme and chronic stress. 
and all of us have these kind of little pauses you know may not be aware of these pauses but they are there in pranayam therefore our job is to smoothen out that and remove extended pauses when you have done that you start focusing on elongating the breath and when you've got a good count fairly um, elongated breath i don't want it to become a big ambitious project that all of you start and push yourself beyond your capacity but for those who really aspire for higher states of consciousness want to really dedicate time to meditation need to work with the breath and should aim for at least 15 or 20 counts inhalation exhalation but remember this is uh, provided that you do it in a gradual step by step manner and not put your entire respiratory system and your entire body under huge amount of stress by forcing yourself to do this therefore gradual having done i have a question here ji yeah who is that sorry i am Uh, that's me, Ashish. Ah, yeah, my Ashish. So, in a particular session uh, about this one is to one and one is to two breathing. So yeah. In a particular session, is it okay to start from a lower count uh, and then move up gradually to a higher count, or uh, as you kind of become more experienced, you should always aim to start with a longer count in in one session? Ideally, you should have gradually increases over a period of time. in our earlier sessions when we did do equal breathing two to one breathing we had this kind of chart where i mapped out a kind of plan where i said okay you can increase it by you know two counts or four counts over a period of time which should take between 6 to 8 months having reached that stage you can within that session really go directly to that count you will have the capacity after 8 months or even a year perhaps it i'm saying 8 months only if you're really dedicatedly doing that for most people i know that's not going to happen so it may even take one year or two years but having reached a certain count if let's take for example you are doing 16 and then 16 out which is a a very respectable you know count to have if you are doing that and you have built it up to 16 when you start a new session you can go directly to 16 if it is easy it should come with ease it should be effortless okay. if it is not then you need to immediately reduce it to an area which is uh, you know to a count which is uh, effortless to you always start so it is okay to increase the count within the session then gradually you can if you want to do it that way yes that's also possible okay. i personally have never done that i have had i mean i'm talking about now 20 years ago or even longer where i increased the count to a certain number and so if if I, if i had been at say 16 in and 16 out and then i started a new session i was able to start at 16 but that doesn't apply for everybody if you feel discomfort then maybe you start at 8 in and 8 out and then just increase it gradually you can do that okay that's totally fine thank you yeah? the most important thing i would say to all of you is the basic rule is do not exert yourself do not go beyond your capacity stay within your capacity at all times if you find you're out of breath gasping for breath feeling the that the body is getting tense because you are not able to inhale more or because you're not able to exhale out more the moment there's tension 
there is something off, you're doing something wrong, there should never be any tension. Tension is not pranayam. That means you are doing something terribly wrong. At all times, you should be relaxed, feeling comfortable. Okay? Having acquired a certain respectable count, and I'm saying around 16, is, is really is a really good count to have, 16 in and 16 out, then you can even drop the numbers. You can stop counting. You can develop a feel for this. And you know, okay, I have around 16 counts. Now I can leave the numbers behind and just drop them. And you're doing Adi Shodnam now without Vishnu Mudra, without your fingers. And when you have reached this stage, then you are coming to the area where we say you are now beginning to really do pranayama. So it is said here, breathing exercises are different. They are superficial. They are important but superficial. They are not called pranayama. They prepare you to do pranayama. Pranayama are deeper exercises. They can be done mentally. Through pranayam, you can apply sushumna. Through breathing, you cannot. That's the difference. Through pranayam, you can have kumbhak for a long time. And then a human being has immense potentials. No limits. We will go to kumbhak eventually. Not today. I don't think we will have time for that. But uh, probably the next session. In this session, we come now to Sushumna, how to apply Sushumna mentally. Having prepared yourself, having dropped the numbers and having dropped Vishnu Mudra, being able to shift the flow of breath from one nostril to the other, just through your attention. These are the three criteria. When you can do these three things, you are ready for Sushumna application. For which you can sit in a good meditation posture, whatever you have trained yourself to sit in, whether it is the Maitriyasana, friendship pose, sitting in a chair, Sukhasana, which is not the ideal position, but if you have not trained yourself, then you should <laughs> train yourself for that. Swastikasana and Siddhasana. These two actually are the best postures. Swastikasana and Siddhasana. If you are at a stage where you are doing Sushumna Kriya, you should have by then, I wouldn't say mastered, but you should be comfortable in either of these two positions. Swastikasana or Siddhasana. And then you can start with simple Sushumna Kriya. You inhale from the base of the spine. You inhale as though you are breathing from the base of the spine. You are obviously not inhaling from the base of the spine. That is impossible. So inhale as though you are breathing from the base of the spine to the crown of the head. Without any disturbance in the breath. Smooth, effortless silent breathing without jerks, without pauses and exhale as though you're exhaling now from the crown of the head to the base of the spine. While you're doing this, you observe your mind and see how many times it becomes distracted. Now because you don't need numbers anymore, you have dropped the numbers, you have actually Smoothen your breath so you won't need much time to observe the jerkiness, the noise and the shallowness of the breath. You, you will see that it is very smooth and you can follow the breath. You keep following it up and then down. In this way, when you do that for a longer time, 
you are also now able to remove extended pauses between breaths. It's a very slight pause. You have removed the larger extended pauses, but now you can remove even the very slight pauses that are there. To remove the pause entirely, we still have to come to the next level. But here we can add the next stage, which could be doing Sushumna Kriya with Soha. We have talked about the caterpillar, which moves from one leaf to another. And when the caterpillar moves from one leaf to another, he doesn't jump from one to another. At some point of time, the caterpillar is on both the leaves. That's the transition phase. You're on leaf one as well as leaf two. And that is what is happening in this practice when you do Sushumna Kriya with Soham. You have a breathing practice together with mantra. You have both. And because you have dropped the numbers, you can focus now your attention. You don't have that many things to manage. You don't have to manage your fingers, you know, doing Vishnu Mudra. You don't need to, to manage the numbers. You are very internalized now. You are beginning to forget your body. You're listening to the sound. It says you're listening to the sound. It's not a mistake. I'm not saying that you should repeat the sound. Just listen to the sound. Listening to the sound so... You inhale. As you exhale from the crown of the head to the base of the spine, you're listening to the sound. Um, so it says here, yeah, the choice of words, listening to the sound is neither accidental nor an error. Listening is one of the passive senses of cognition and not active. If you would repeat and say so and hum, you would be using which indriya? You would be using the speech indriya, which is one of the active indriyas. While listening is one of the cognitive indriyas, it is not an active indriya. And that's the difference. You are shifting now from external to internal and you're shifting from the active indriyas to the passive or cognitive indriya, which is a very important step to learn. In some traditions, one encourages the active repetition of mantra. This may be useful in the beginning for some of you. You may want to do it. But the practice of listening is a finer practice. So even if you should decide initially, if you are not quite able to get the hang of listening to the mantra, you can initially repeat it, say it internally, not loudly, not outside, but internally in your mind. You can say, so, um, after a while, when you're comfortable, you can drop the repetition as well and then focus on listening. Any questions so, so far? Okay, no questions, then go ahead. Now we're coming to a still finer version of this practice. And this is omitting the pause. Now, you saw this here. And when I 
showed it to you. I did the motion. But now it seems your breath gets finer and the pause really is completely gone. And so Amirama says, breath and mind, when they are perfectly coordinated, the practice is accomplished when they function. There is no pause. Pause means killer. Pause means death. Means you have annihilated death when you have done breathing like this. Past, present and future become one and the same. You're going to let that sit there. Even if you don't understand entirely what it means, it's okay. But the practice of eliminating the pause completely means having a very, very fine, gentle breath. So fine that anybody observing you breathing externally would think you're not breathing at all. So very fine breath. It is finer practice than the Sushumna Kriya. And when you do this for a longer period, you notice, you might notice that many practices seem to converge together, merge and become one. Here you might observe that equal breathing, Sushumna Kriya, Soham, you know, mantra practice, Pranayam, all seem to suddenly merge together and that is a sign of great progress. Anybody has any questions on this, on the omitting the pause? Actually, the practice can also be done with, um, with OM. So instead of doing SOHAM, one can also just do it with OM. Just want to find it. Okay, let's see how to do it. Oh yes, here I have it. Okay, so that's now you're seeing Sushumna Kriya with Om. And we are omitting the pause. This practice should only be done if you have already mastered omitting the pause. If you have mastered this, you can also do the same practice with OM. And here you would listen to the sound OM. So what happens here is the exhalation is the sound OM and then you're listening to the silence. With the inhalation you're listening to the silence. The exhalation you're listening to the sound OM. It goes into the silence. You listen to the silence. <clears throat> so that was Sushumna Kriya with Om.
If you practice these over a long period of time, unbroken practice over a long period of time, then you might notice something very beautiful happening. And that is you will see the light of Sushumna emerging out of the darkness. And this is not a mere visualization technique. We are not saying visualize Sushumna. It's not a visualization technique. When you do this practice for a long period of time, unbroken practice, what happens is you are activating the Sushumna. That is exactly what the purpose is. So when the Sushumna is open and when it rises, you will see it in your meditation. How did the yogis know that there were 70,000 channels, pranic channels, nadis? How did they know that there were three main ones? How did they know there was one central scanalis? They saw it in meditation. You too can see it in meditation. You too can become a yogi or a sage of that high order. Why not visualization? There are a lot of traditions, lineages out there that practice a lot of visualization techniques, especially those who are doing Kundalini practices. You know? Under Kundalini practices, there are many visualization techniques being offered. So why not? Why not the visualization? Because visualization requires the use of the active senses. You want to have the light emerge out of the darkness. You don't want to create a light or superimpose this light upon the darkness. You want to see the inner light. How will you see the inner light if you add more lights there? So visualization, adding lights is not going to help you with the progress. If you want the shortest, simplest method is, as we say in our tradition, to make your abode in darkness. One met message out of that is yes, uh, preferably have a nice dark room in which you can do your practice. But that's not exactly what is meant. What is meant is sit in the internal darkness and the light will emerge from within you. The light is already there. It is not seen because you are adding so many external things all the time. Therefore, I always say, less is more. When you do complicated practices, where you have numbers and, and uh, you know, different uh, finger positions and mudras and coordinated with more movement and breathing and etc., all these things makes, makes it so complicated that you don't have any attention or awareness for the light within you. So if you want to let the light of Sushumna emerge, sit there in the darkness, listen, watch, and you will find that the light will emerge on its own. Okay, any questions so far? <laughs> I see there are some questions. Yeah. 
Go ahead. Um, I just wanted to ask um, this light. Uh, what is it? <laughs> it's your internal light. It's the light that is within you and me and everybody. That's the light okay, of consciousness. Con yes. That's the light of consciousness. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, and, uh, yeah, okay. And, and this is the individual consciousness? When you experience it in the body, it is individual consciousness, yes. You will experience... And how do you know that it's experienced in the body? Because we just said that the light emerges and you see it. That's prana itself, which you're seeing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it, it's the prana, basically, you're saying, mm -hmm. this light. It's the and, and it's similar to the universal life, uh, light as well. Yes, yes. You are uh, a and, and how does it differ? I mean, how... How do you know that it's your body's light, and or or does it not matter because it's the same? As long as you are in a body, in a sense, you are separate from me, right? And as mm -hmm. long as you experience that separateness, there's an individual soul, or in, we, you know, it's called the Atman, and that that Atman is different from Paramatman, which is the cosmic soul. It's only when you drop the body and if you have no more some scars that bring you back to this plane that you will merge into that cosmic self. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. So it means not coming back, basically. Yes. And so right now okay. what you will experience, when you do experience, it is always prana at a very deep level is basically a part of that uh, individual consciousness and the quality of that it's the same thing as cosmic consciousness if you take a drop out of the ocean a drop of water out of the ocean isn't it the same as the ocean itself right mm -hmm. yeah, yeah it's, it's all clear thank you yeah so yeah. okay patricia asked what about personal mantra Yes, Patricia, I know where that question is coming from. Yeah? Um, normally, this practice is done with Shoham or with Om. I know that there are, I'm aware of this, that uh, within our tradition, uh, there are people who are being asked to, to use this practice with the Guru Mantra. Now I'm just going to ask you to think a little bit about this because as long as you are going up and down the spine, you will be at the body level. It is only when you leave this and go entirely, leave the body behind and you're in the mind with your thoughts that you have only mantra. Now, Remember the example of the caterpillar. It was on one leaf, moving to the next leaf. So you would have to leave that leaf behind. You know, the body, you have to leave the body behind and only be with the mantra. Normally, you use the guru mantra only when you come to your given object of meditation, which is either the uh, Agya Chakra or the Heart Chakra, the Anath Chakra. And when doing Sushumna Kriya, one uses preferably Soham or Om. But as I have always said, uh, there are different teachers even within our tradition have different approaches. And I do not wish to comment on what is right or what is wrong. I have personally found this to be much more effective, as I explained. Here, the body is still there. You're still at the level of the body. Somewhere there, there is still the breath. With the Guru Mantra, you should have left these behind already. That comes later. 
because otherwise you have far too many things, okay? You would have body, you would have breath, and you would have Guru Mantra. And if you see the process, it goes here from simple just breathing with the spine, listening to the mantra, working with the breath, and learning to omit the pause, allowing the light to emerge. You see, there are a lot of factors. And to use the Guru Mantra with so many different factors, other factors would take away from the mantra practice itself. And so it is better to use the Guru Mantra at a much further stage for the level, uh, at a deeper level. All right. So Matthew says the light, is it just symbolic? No, no, it's not just symbolic. You will see a light. You will see the light of consciousness if you do this right. What if we start to feel the spine starts to lengthen? <laughs> I hope your spine is not going to lend in that, Matthias. Okay, no, no worry. <laughs> it's cute. Uh, you don't have to worry. When you are in meditation, you're completely safe. Okay, uh, don't, don't, yes, people are putting now so many things suddenly, um, one at a time. All right. So. Matthias, it may be a feeling, you are perhaps having a feeling that the spine is lengthening because you are elongating the breath and, and you're, you're, you're breathing slower. So it, it seems to feel uh, it's taking ages, you know, well, that's probably why you have the feeling. Kalpna. Um, Kadna, what if the personal mantra comes up naturally during Sushumna Kriya? Well, it, I don't know what you mean by comes up naturally. Generally, the personal mantra will not come up naturally unless you have put it there. In the sense that instead of using, re repeating Soham, you have been repeating your Guru Mantra then of course you have created the habit. It's a groove and you have created that groove and so it will happen, right? And then of course you will, you will say, okay, it's coming up naturally, but it came up, came there at all because you connected the two. And that's the difference between listening and repeating. That's why I said the final practice is to listen. without having created the habit in the first place. If you have created the habit, the mantra, the Guru Mantra will come up there because you have created the habit. All right. So now from here, we will be going eventually to Sandhya, which is the next step. So, yes, we did omitting the pause. We did it with Om. We explained how allowing the light to emerge. And now we need to correct some misconceptions about omitting the pause. So now a lot of people are having difficulties understanding well, what is this omitting the pause. Now if you see the practice was here, yeah, well, let me just get back to my
Bedroom. So this was omitting the pause here. Inhale, listening to the sound. So exhale, listening to the sound. Hum. Then you have omitted the pause. As you all know, if you just observe your breath carefully, extended pauses have been removed. Those are people who are gasping for breath, presuming that none of us are doing that. But the finer pauses, that's the trick. Now, people look at this diagram and think, hmm, am I supposed to visualize an oval here? It's not a visualization practice. There is, seems to be no other way to explain this. This is actually just one line here. If this is your sushumna, you're going up here and you're going down here. You know, you're not going in an oval shape. These are the limitations of using a diagram. You know? Because we showed inhalation and then exhalation. But you're doing inhalation and exhalation on, along one line. You're doing inhalation here and exhalation here. So similarly, when you omit the pause, you also do inhalation and exhalation without any pause. What you do not do is start breathing in an oval shape. And you will not go along Ida and Pingala here. You're going to stay with the centralis canalis. So these are some of the misconceptions. This is, of course, a result of the diagrams. It's very difficult to explain without a diagram. But the diagram itself is, in a sense, uh, wrong. Because we are not inhaling and exhaling along two different lines. These are not... To go back to the original one here. Here, th this is not Ida or Pingala, you know, these two. You're not inhaling here separately and here. You're always inhaling and exhaling along the centralis canalis. Okay? So these, that's one of the misconceptions. Do not turn this into a visualization practice. When I put this on the website, at that time I made a little mistake. I still have to remove this uh, diagram and substitute it with the one I showed you. Over here I wrote with oval breath. You know, I was um, trying to uh, give it a, somehow a way to describe it, which was easy. But I realized that when I did that, people started thinking that they have to visualize an oval. And, and try, you know, so they started calling it the oval breath or circular breath. And, and I realized that that was um, misleading. So I changed it back to the original, which is simply omitting the pause. So I need to change this diagram still. Okay. Any other doubts that require clarification here? That was just a couple of ideas that I know um, that people misunderstand. So if there is any other doubt that you want to have clarified. Another thing is when you use, if you get um, 
fascinated with the idea of using OM, for instance, I would not recommend you to use this practice with OM unless you're very clear what you want, what your purpose of your life is. If you are ready for this internal sannyasa, vairagya, only then should you take up this practice. This practice is not suitable for those who are unprepared. So while I have put this here as a part of mastering pranayam, I want to emphasize that Sushumna Kriya with Om omitting the pause should not be done unless you are really well prepared and clear about the purpose of your life. That is also why I initially did not put it on the website itself. I mean, it's still not on the website. Okay, so the last little interesting uh, thing before we end the session is what is the difference between Buddha Shuddhi and Sushumna Kriya? I presume all of you know what Buddha Shuddhi is, but just for those who don't, Bhuta Shuddhi is a practice in which you go through the chakras, the six chakras, generally five or six chakras, um, one by one, focusing on each, starting right at the bottom um, with the first chakra and sort of meditating on it and repeating a mantra, moving to the second, repeating mantra, third chakra, same, you know, the whole process goes um, into repeating mantras at each point of time. Now you can see just from the description of this practice that Bhuta Shuddhi involves repetition of mantra at each of the chakras. It requires, there are some very complicated versions of Bhuta Shuddhi which require a lot of visualization and um, these are all lower practices. These are not finer practices. Sushumna Kriya, you can call it a finer version of Bhuta Shuddhi. Actually, there's no difference between the two. They're the same. Only one is a more grosser external practice with repetition, which is the active indriya, while sushumna is a deeper practice with a finer breath, with listening, and it flows through the sushumna. Bhuta Shuddhi goes step by step and at each chakra you are doing a certain number of inhalations, exhalations, you know. And so if you get the hang of how these practices are developed, you will begin to see it is very scientific. The practices go from gross to subtle. They go from external to internal. They go from movement to stillness. We have done that before. So, to answer Matthias, if you are doing Sushumna Kriya, if you have practiced the way it has been built up now, 
through the step-by-step -step process of going through the breathing, etc., removing the jerks, you know, all these things. Six steps, you know, come to the seventh step. And if you do it that way, you do not need Buddha Shuddhi because you are doing Buddha Shuddhi. This is the finest method of doing Buddha Shuddhi. Those practices of Buddha Shuddhi that are being marketed in the form of books and CDs and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, are lower practices. So if you're doing something like this, then why do you need to do a lower practice? Okay. Does that make sense? Does that sound reasonable? Does that sound scientific? We have talked about these here. When we did this chapter, the criteria for advanced pranayam, we said it goes from gross to subtle, from external to internal, from movement to stillness. So all these aspects. So if you take that into consideration, you will see that Sushumna Kriya, the way it has been explained here, is a far finer and subtler practice than Buddha Shuddhi. In Buddha Shuddhi, you actively repeat mantra and here you're listening to the mantra. Here you're going by step by step with the um, uh, from one mantra to another, from one chakra to the other, here you flow from one mantra to another, uh, sorry, you flow with the sound of the mantra and you flow from one chakra to the other. Think of two instruments. If you have a piano and you go from one note to another, it's a very, uh, the word they use in Western music is staccato, no? Joachim, please correct me if I'm wrong. Is that the right word? Staccato is when you just hit one, one note and just leave it there and just yes. remove it immediately. Yes. So when you go from note to note, no, it's, it's staccato. It's going from one to another. It's very static. Now compare this with a violin. In violin, you cannot have that kind of thing. You cannot have... a you know, you always go in these very, very fine melodies moving from one note to another where they seem to merge into each other. Right, Joachim? Yes, it is much more obvious on the violin because it normally you have to produce a sound yourself. It requires a kind of a flow. Mm -hmm. So for what do you, for which instrument do you need a very fine ear? <laughs> for the violin. Yes. So even if you're not an expert in music, you can imagine the fine nuances which a violin can produce as opposed to the piano. Because there is a flow from one to another and which requires also far more skill you actually have to produce those you have to produce the music in the piano you you don't have to really produce the music itself so and you can be even deaf and playing the piano the violin you can't <laughs> exactly and that's why beethoven could do that he was deaf and he could play the piano yes but you can't do that if you're a violinist you need very sharp ears for that. And that's the direction this is going into. For mantra, we are going into this area of mantra now. You need to have very fine ear. You need to listen. Listening is far more important. These are these finer aspects of mantra vidya, which merge now. Pranayam and mantra vidya, they begin to merge. When we are talking about real prana, practice a real pranayam. As defined uh, earlier, we said it's done mentally and it is not uh, a breathing exercise. It's done mentally and 
it will unleash immense powers beyond limits, no limitations, when you begin to get the hang of this. And so, next session, we will do Sandhya, very, very beautiful practice. And uh, I don't know whether we will have time also to do Kumbhak, but if not, then the following session. But now we are really coming to the very, very exciting part of advanced pranayam. And uh, I hope you enjoyed it because I thoroughly enjoyed myself today. We end the session here, and uh, you see most of you on Friday. Enjoy whatever is left of your weekend, and um, we catch up on Friday. Those who join in from Bhagavad Gita. Bye bye, everyone. Hi, all. Thank you so much, Radhika. Thank, Thank you. Bye bye, everyone. Thank you. Nice session.